to it. The deficit, who else? Martin Feldstein, let's bring him in uh, right now. And what we need is, is, let's get right to dreaded first chart. Taxes, spending, spending taxes, bring it up right away. Dreaded first chart, can we grow taxes? Here's income tax per capita. There's a lot of charts like this, ebbing off in the slowdown. And to come back, if GDP comes back, Obviously, we get more tax revenue, tax receipts. Is it enough to save the day? No. No, there's no question that as the economy grows, tax receipts will rise, and they'll rise a little faster mm -hmm. than the uh, economy. But they're not going to grow fast enough to get rid of an enormous projected fiscal deficit. What did you think of the last two weeks shutdown averted? Did you see that in your younger days? <laughs> Yeah, we've seen that before. Yeah. Uh, it's a kind of... Ballet. Yeah, well, I was going to say cliff-walking exercise, but it doesn't really accomplish much. Is there value in Ryan? Is there value in the Obama uh, speech? There's a lot of serious stuff in the Ryan proposal. Uh, he really, for the first time I think I've ever seen, really laid out a full uh, picture of what needs to be done on entitlements, uh, on tax expenditures, on general annually appropriated stuff. That was really good. How, how much difference is there between now and the Reagan budget drama? Are we a factor difference? Are we 10 times worse off? Can Things you were it? not nearly as bad in the worst of the Reagan days. Uh, in the worst of the Reagan days, it was mostly cyclical mm -hmm. rather than this fundamental structural. We never, when I was in the White House, in the Reagan White House, we would never have forecast five years without getting back to budget balance. Now, now we're playing with 10 and 12 10 years. 10 years and 5% of GDP deficits all the way out there. So if there isn't a correction from the Obama budget, mm -hmm. uh, we'd be looking at uh, the debt to GDP ratio continuing to rise up to about 90%. A chart we've shown all week, we make light of your uh, many decades watches. You can see it down here, Professor Feldstein. Yeah. Better, our debt before Martin Feldstein, he was with Lincoln uh, in the Civil War. You can see it there in the middle. This from Elmendorf and CBO, the Revolutionary War debt paid mm -hmm. off. The Civil War debt paid off. World World War II, that spike, the debt paid off, took a while. What, what happened with the phrase paid off? Is, well, this, is this a cultural economic debate? No, it, it wasn't paid off after World War II. But at the end of World War II, the national debt was 109% of GDP. And 15 years later, it was 46% of GDP. And how did they do that remarkable thing? They did it by not letting the nominal debt, the debt in current dollars, grow at all for 15 years. That meant there were some years with deficits, but other years with surpluses. The surpluses just balanced out the deficit. So for 15 <clears throat> years, there was no accumulation of debt. Well, then you had the economy growing, grew at about 2.5%. Inflation was a little over 3%. So the debt to GDP ratio came down from 109 to 46. Are we a welfare state? We are certainly spending most of our money, not really on welfare, but on transfer uh, payments. Yes. Transfer payments. So it's not means-tested stuff. Right. It's not helping the poor. It is just transfers Moving to, money around. Well, it's giving money to seniors and other voting blocks. You're associated with the Republicans. What value do you see in the president's speech? What is in there? What kernel does the president have that can bring him towards the well, Republicans? I was very disappointed in the speech. I was hoping... Give, no, no, That's I a was, break exclusive, No, folks. no, I was hoping, <laughs> given what he had said, um, uh, or what the White House had right. said in advance, that, quote, everything's going to be on the table. But there was really nothing significant on the table for Medicaid, uh, for Medicare. What there was was an explanation of why he really wasn't going to do anything mm -hmm. and why he didn't like the Republican plan. So the, what's the one hope in there? Uh, the one hope in there was about Social Security, about which he said very little. 
mm -hmm. but hinted that there was grounds for sitting down and compromising on that. We're going to go right to chart three, if you would, Rex. And with us, Martin Feldstein. Feldstein and Marin consider a proper deficit. Here we are. This is a chart everybody knows. There's that surplus, Professor, and you talked about deficit surplus, deficit surplus. This chart back 30 years is deficit, 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 a surplus and down. Where do we need to get back to? Is, is a negative 3% deficit to GDP, is that where we want to be? Not if we want to really bring down this enormous debt to GDP ratio. The total debt. You know, we could stabilize it at 80% of GDP, but that's not a good outcome. So I think we need to get back to budget balance. We get back to budget balance the way they did after World War II, and we hold it there for 10, 15 years. Then we finally get the debt to GDP ratio back to the 30, 40 percent that we had until recently. In, in your study of fiscal history, there has to be a catalyst to engage political debate. Is it just as simple as 100 beeps in the interest rate? Is it a dollar decline, which you have predicted? No, I don't think um, 100 basis points will do it. I don't think, uh, I think the dollar will decline, but I don't think that's going to do it. I think the American public has to look out there and say, this is awful. We're talking about enormous future debt service, annual interest payments of close to a trillion dollars, if we're not careful, interest payments of close to a trillion dollars. So that's what will put pressure on Congress to cut back. I still want to know where the catalyst is going to be to put pressure. I mean, are you suggesting an, essentially a budget revolt the first Tuesday of, of November? I don't think there was a catalyst in 1946. I think people said, look, we came through the war. We had to pay for it. It drove up the national debt mm -hmm. to more than 100 percent of GDP. That's abnormal. We've got to get it back down to a much more manageable level. Let's bring up some optimism within your economic caution. You can see it again, Professor, down here. Uh, production pleases Feldstein, industrial production today. There's the fall off the cliff, and we come back very nicely. We're really, we're really doing better, but we don't have the real GDP or the nominal GDP to staunch that deficit growth, do we? Absolutely not. No. What number do we need? We're not going to do it with economic growth We're not going to, okay, period. thank you. Period. So you've got to stabilize, you've got to do the fiscal policy, the spending and tax revenue, you've got to mm -hmm. stabilize the, the debt, and then growth can bring down the debt to GDP ratio. I, I, I talk about Orzag's glide pass. I just happened to hear this from Peter Orzag, who has done very good work, uh, some would say, on the other side of the fence. But is it a glide path or he is Mark jumped Felsen? over the fence, I noticed recently. <laughs> okay. But anyway. Um, anyways, I uh, jumped over the fence. And um, when you look at glide path versus a jump condition solution, are you looking for some drama here? Or can we have that 5 or 10 or 15 year solution? Uh, we're going to have to have it over a long period of time. We're not going to take the, the debt to GDP ratio down from the current 70 percent to 30 um, percent to in a short time. Mm -hmm. even, the, even Paul Ryan's very good plan only brings the debt to GDP ratio down at the end of 10 years by a little bit. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, uh, bring up um, uh, the Paul Ryan quote. Thank you, Alan, for doing that. And here it is from the Washington Post today. Some would use support. Many others don't. A budget for the 21st century. We cannot accept an approach that starts from the premise that ever higher levels of spending and taxes represent America's new normal. Which of those two are you focused on? I mean, we know, I don't think I have to go into the polarity that's out there. Or do we need both? Is it just that simple? We need solutions to both spending and taxes. Uh, well, we need both. We need to deal with the long-term spending of the entitlement programs. But we also need to deal with the spending that's built into the tax code. I think one of the things that the Fiscal Commission emphasized and that you and I have talked about in the right. past is that a lot of what is really spending is not in the outlay side of the budget, it's built into the tax code. 
I want to look at the tax code down. This is something you looked at closely. Corporate tax, elegant chart, folks. Corporate tax distortions distort. And you can see here profits. This is NEPA profits. Up they go. They collapse on the right side, the white line, and they come right, right back. We all know this. We tell National Semiconductor. And the yellow is corporate taxes. Are corporations paying their fair share within your fiscal analysis? <laughs> One of the strange things about corporations that keeps down their tax payments is that if they leave money abroad, they don't have to pay tax on it. Right. If they bring that money back, they have to pay a lot of tax. We're the only country in the world that has that rule. Should we do the repatriation thing, another, free, another gift, rather, I should say? No, but what we should do is do what other countries do and say, if you bring your profits back as you earn them, then we'll put a small tax on and you can invest the money in the United States. And the reason that corporations pay less tax as a share of their book profits is that a lot of those profits are <clears throat> earned and kept abroad. Right. So we need to go to the same glo global system, the so-called territorial system, right. that every other country now uses. We're going to have a three-hour show someday. You and I could go for three <laughs> hours. Capping individual tax expenditure benefits. Feldstein, Feinberg, McGinnis. Rex, see if you can bring up this quote from uh, that paper, singling out one is how it uh, begins here. This is, this is a dangerous word, fair. It's like synergy <laughs> or innovation. Fair, I, I hope, I circle fair. See if we can bring that quote up. Maybe we're not gonna be able to get it. Let me read it while we get it up here. Singling out one or a small number of tax expenditures to eliminate strikes many taxpayers is unfair. Right. Fair is a non-economic word. You dive into politics there. It, it uh, happens from time to time that I dive into politics. But basically, when uh, tax reformers say, well, let's stop the mortgage deduction or let's stop the, the health care deduction, uh, people say, why that? Why not other things? And why are you taking away something that I've depended upon? So what I and my colleagues wrote about in the paper you just referred to is putting a general cap, saying you can have all the deductions that you're accustomed to. But mortgage, you get 2%. But the, the value of those deductions, the tax reduction that you get from them, can't, you can't be greedy about it. Mortgage You've deduction, got to, all the rest, you can have all that everything. stuff, but when you add it all up and you figure out how mm -hmm. much it reduces your tax bill, you've got to limit that to some small percentage of your AGI. Alan Greenspan, a single moment, I said this to Orphanides last night, the governor of the Bank of Cyprus, shared sacrifice. Is that what's missing now in the debate? Is it we're not having a debate of a shared sacrifice, as the chairman Greenspan would put it? Yes, I would say that is missing. I would say that what the president said was he wanted to limit tax expenditures for the top 2%. Mm -hmm. That's not shared sacrifice. That's yes. back to his egalitarian agenda. Very good. Martin Feldstein, thank you so much.